There comes a time in every marriage when the rose fades. It's not that the love is gone or that you hate each other, but things don't seem so new anymore. For some couples, this may be the best time in their relationship. For others, it may be the worst. This can be a defining moment for a marriage because you have to take a hard look at things and decide if you want to stay married to this person. The phrase, it's cheaper to keep it, had to be coined by a guy who reached this point. This is about the same moment when you look at the girl you fell in love with and married, only to realize that she has somehow been replaced by her mother, whom you hate. That slender feminine body has been modernized and enhanced until you no longer recognize it or even desire it. At the same time, the personalities of both yours and hers have evolved to such an extent that the dream you dreamed of when you met has come true. You both really are completely honest with each other. First of all, we need to understand that people, although we talk about it all the time and respect it, are simply not designed for real honesty. We just can't handle it. When you love someone, you almost have to lie to them and do it regularly. We lie in a thousand different ways, and verbally is only one of them. But once we reach that certain age where we've fully evolved, when we become the ideal version of ourselves, we just don't care anymore. We become so comfortable with who and what we are that we simply don't find it worth the effort to pretend anymore. That's when the lies stop and the real begins. So, you have a beer belly? Put it on display for everyone to see. You are lazy. Buy yourself a new sofa. You have bad eyesight. Throw away your contacts and buy a big fucking TV. You no longer have to hide any of your flaws from the baby because you are married to her and you have been together for so long that you still have to put up with each other. Don't worry, guys. They do it too. For women, it's time to ditch the push-up bras and stop wearing high heels. They realize that all sexy lingerie is just uncomfortable and all you're going to do is take it off of them to get what you want. So they buy a hundred pairs of granny panties and challenge you to say a word about it. Oh, boys, let the good times roll. So, I'm 54 years old. Thanks to some good investments early on and a downturn in the auto industry, I am retired. Thanks to my genius as an engineer and some patents I developed for my company, they could no longer afford to pay my salary. And with my retirement package going to zero, it became clear to some accountants that the smartest thing for the company would be to offer me a buyout. It was a win-win situation for everyone. The company gives me a lump sum payout in the upper single digit millions, so I don't have to work for the rest of my damn life anymore. On the other hand, they get to license my patents and can write the cost of my extremely high six-figure salary off their books and also hire a new young staff of engineers to breathe some much needed life into the company. This was fine for everyone for the first year or so before the inevitable boredom set in on my end. My wife liked the idea at first. We now had both time and money to do all those things for which we previously had neither time nor money. We started by downsizing our holdings and moving into a shiny and modern brand new condominium. Since our only child was already living independently, we no longer needed a large house. It took the first six months. Then we started traveling around the world. It took another six months until we realized that wherever you go, it's just another place that the people living there are already dead tired of. We settled into a new condominium, and familiarity began to breed what it usually breeds. I began to notice new things about my wife, Linda, that 30 years of marriage had failed to show me. I mean, I still loved her. I just didn't like her. I think it was because we just spent too much time together. The day lasts 24 hours. The average person spends 8 to 10 of these hours at work. The average person also sleeps about 8 hours. You also have time to travel to and from your destination. Various hobbies and activities interfere with a large chunk of your day. I suddenly realized that, with the exception of our vacations, Linda and I spent only a few hours a day together. Now suddenly I was trapped with her 24 hours a day, seven days a week until one of us died. It also suddenly became apparent to me that Linda and I had nothing in common except our daughter, and that Linda was either, to quote temptations, a ball of confusion, or just plain stupid. First of all, let me start by saying that I didn't marry Linda because I thought she was a genius. 
I married her because she was willing and good in bed, hotter than hell, and had a nice personality. Like most engineers, I had several reasons for my decision, as you can see. I also considered that time might take away one or even two of these worthy qualities from her, but even if any of them remained, she would still be worth spending time together. Wow, I was wrong. As for sex, over time she began to use it against me. You know the story. If she wanted something and I didn't, she would use sex to get it. This worked for the first few years until suddenly I developed the ability to say no to her. Then she started telling me no until she got her way. Somewhere after the first 10 years, it became easier to do without it than to put up with her crap. So now it was a thing where it was from time to time if we both wanted it. As for her beauty, I screwed up there too. Linda was amazingly beautiful when we met. She had large, firm breasts, a thin waist, and a nice size butt. There are many 50-year-old women who work on themselves and are still incredibly hot. There are also many 50-year-old women who don't work on themselves, but are blessed with good genetics and remain very hot. Finally, there are many 50-year-old women for whom their sex appeal has nothing to do with their appearance. They have a flirtatious nature or other skills that just make you want them. Unfortunately, Linda does not fit into any of these cases. Over time, she just let herself go, so her body and looks went away. When she was 25, Linda's measurements were 102, 66, 97 sem. And I am very proud to say that today she has exactly the same measurements. The problem is not in the numbers, but in the order in which they appear. Her breasts are still quite large, but are now a very flabby 97 semometers. Her belly has grown to an astounding 102 semometers and it looks like her butt has simply deflated to just 66 gesek centimeters. Linda still thinks she looks the same, even though no one tells her otherwise. Part of our problem was that we were just different. I'm not perfect by any means. I analyze every detail, I'm a slave to my schedule, and I'm sure over the years several of my interests and hobbies have taken precedence over my marriage. But hey, I tried and never cheated on her. I've always been an average-looking guy, so I had to try harder. I've been involved in sports most of my life, so now in my later years, I'm still in good shape thanks to daily workouts and runs. Linda, on the other hand, got her beauty from genetics. Her body was a gift from God, so she never thought that she needed to do anything to keep it in shape. This was one of our problems when traveling. I always needed to hit the gym at every hotel we stayed in because they say it's easier to stay in shape than to get in shape. Linda always thought that I shouldn't exercise at all on holiday. She didn't like my need to run in the morning or do a little weight training. She said it made her feel like we were on a schedule rather than a real vacation. On the other hand, I didn't like that we couldn't do anything because of Lindy's inability to walk more than a block or two on level ground and her constant need to eat. Every new activity I suggested was met with comments like, We can't do this. It takes too much energy. Or she would say, We can't do this. This is for children. The last thing I was about to learn about the love of my life was that her personality had deteriorated along with her body. Over the years, she has become an expert in everything and a hypocrite at the same time. On the one hand, she told me that a woman can do everything a man can do. She also told me that since neither of us were working anymore, even though she never worked, we must share household responsibilities among ourselves. I'm not a chauvinist. I was for it. I would get up early and exercise while Linda slept and then start doing all my household chores. I did exactly half of what was on the list and left the rest for her. She conveniently avoided most of her share of responsibilities by saying that some things were simply not for women. One of these, of course, was taking out the trash. I don't understand why women, who all swear they can do anything a man can do, find it so difficult to pick up a bag of household rubbish, carry it to the bin, and throw it away. It can't be due to weight, because the average trash bag weighs less than 9 kilograms and is mostly filled with paper or wrappers and discarded food. But Linda insisted that no woman should ever take out the trash. She was sure there was a rule somewhere prohibiting this. Either way, it was the trash of everything else that ended my marriage. It seemed so stupid that two people who loved each other 
could quarrel over taking out the trash. But that's what destroyed us. Linda came in one Saturday morning and told me to take out the trash she had just filled. I, of course, just started watching one of my favorite athletics matches on TV. As a keen runner, I loved watching athletes who were the best in the world in the sport I love. Linda, who certainly couldn't run a block if she was being chased by a pack of pit bulls, didn't understand this. Stan, I need you to take out the trash now, she said. It's not like she asked me to do it. It was her tone of voice and complete disrespect for what I was doing. No, I said. Until you take out the trash, you won't have sex, she snorted. It's been a long time since you stopped giving me sex, I said. I will survive. For some reason, she got very angry and just walked away. Since there were only two of us in the house, we didn't really make much of a mess, so the bag wasn't even full. Next thing I know, she walks past me, giving me glances, carrying a bag. She came back five minutes later, still giving me glances, but that's how it started. It became very cold between us for a week, and then suddenly she made up with me. I don't know why or how. It seemed, at least to me, spontaneous. It's like we've never been angry. I wasn't angry at all. She was the one who was angry. Maybe she just decided it was stupid and just decided to let it go. I started to feel guilty after we made up, but since everything was going well between us, I didn't want to escalate the situation. It's funny, but when I tried to take out the trash, she wouldn't let me do it anymore. She just flared up and snatched the bags from my hands. I understand what's going on, I said. You're still mad at me. No, Stanley, she said, kissing my forehead. I'm not mad at you. I understand, I said. You just don't want me to take out the trash because you still don't want to have sex with me. Stanley, we can have sex whenever you want, she said. It probably won't be very convenient tonight if you let me shower first. I could not understand. It wasn't like Linda to just give up. Over the next few days, my guilt motivated me more than anything else. With Valentine's Day approaching, I decided to splurge and buy Linda the diamond bracelet that she had so unequivocally eyed and stared at in the jewelry ads. I even went further and increased the carat value. I spent almost $3,000 on a bracelet that I was sure she would love. I also planned an evening out at our favorite restaurant. I had arranged the flowers and everything else. It was going to be a Valentine's Day to remember. I didn't wait until the last minute. We still had over a week until Valentine's Day arrived. I felt pretty good then. I was even proud that for the first time I didn't sneak out on Valentine's Day morning and buy her the first cheap thing I could find. And for the first time I didn't tell her that we had celebrated so many Valentine's Days together that if she still didn't know that I loved her, then there was something wrong with her. The thing is, I think I've started to rethink everything. Of course, her appearance didn't improve but her attitude has definitely improved. And like I said, the love was still there. But the fact that Linda became nicer and just let go of some of our arguments gave me a reason to love her again. One of the things I noticed was that, over the last few weeks, we have started producing a lot more trash. It used to be that we actually had to take out the trash once or twice a week. Now it was at least three or four times a week. The other strange thing was that Linda seemed to be gone for much longer than it took to simply go outside the building and dump the bag into the large dumpsters there. When it came time to take out the trash the day before Valentine's Day, I decided to do it for her. She had a huge fight about it. I had to listen to the whole speech about how women can do everything men can do, so I decided to just let it go. I turned on the TV and started looking for something to watch. Linda grabbed the trash bags and walked out the door. I quietly opened the door and watched her turn the corner at the end of the corridor. I quickly went down the stairs at the other end of the corridor and went out into the street. I hoped that I wouldn't miss her since it was quite dark. In fact, I was faster than her and got there before she made the trek. These daily runs kept me in great shape. I saw our building manager, Dino, doing something in front of his dirty BMW. The car was over ten years old and in terrible condition, but he treated it like it was something special. My 2010 Mustang GT looked and performed much better than his car ever did. 
Linda also acted like his car was something special, probably because she hated my Mustang. I wondered what the hell Dino was doing there, but I didn't focus on him. I wanted to find out what was so special about trash. Linda walked past the trash can and headed towards Dino. He was a big, fat guy. He bent down and immediately unzipped his fly. Linda knelt down. After a few minutes, he pushed her away. Linda unbuttoned her jacket and there was nothing underneath. She sat on the hood of his car and spread her legs. The skirt was pulled up to the waist. Dino didn't hesitate. I was too shocked to move or say anything. I still remember every detail, as if they were gnawing into my brain. It seemed to last forever. Then he just lifted his pants and walked away, as if nothing had happened. I waited until Linda returned to the building and then quickly walked up the stairs. I was too shocked to even think about what I had just seen. Linda entered the apartment just seconds after I sat down in front of the TV. As she walked past me, she behaved as usual. She wasn't too happy. She wasn't defensive. If I hadn't seen what I just saw, I would never have suspected anything. Perhaps what they say is true. Women are much better at being secretive than men. In fact, she was so much better than me at this that she almost caught me off guard. She brought me dos eki from the refrigerator and then looked at me. What's wrong, Stan? She asked. I didn't look away from the TV. I didn't even look at her. Nothing, I said, trying to make my voice sound normal. Then why are your cheeks wet? Have you been crying? She asked. Oh, that, I said. The damn Jamaicans beat us in the relay again. I was so excited that I accidentally hit myself in the eye with my finger. I'm sure they're doping, but no one can prove it yet. She looked at me carefully. I think I'll take my Mustang for a ride, I said. At night? She asked. Why not? I asked. Well, I was going to take a long, soothing bath first, but I was hoping we could she said. We could do what? I asked. You know, she said, smiling. It's been a while, dear. Sorry, I said. I'm not in the mood. And I really wasn't. The only reason she wanted to have sex with me was because she was guilty of what she had just done. I didn't think I'd ever touch her again. I grabbed my favorite old leather jacket and headed towards the door. She just stood there with her mouth open, as I opened the door, she called me. Stan, do you want me to come with you? She asked. For what? I asked. You don't even like my car. I closed the door both physically and metaphorically. In a physical sense, closing the door sealed our apartment and prevented theft or harm to its occupants and contents. In a metaphorical sense, I sealed my broken heart and decided that Linda would not harm it or my well-being any further. As I walked toward the garage, I noticed Dahlia Martin. She was a very beautiful young woman who lived in one of the rooms. She was tall and thin with long hair that was just begging for attention. I smiled at her and waved. She answered my greetings rather coolly. Dahlia was usually very friendly, so this caught my attention. I approached her to ask what happened. My stupid car won't start, she pouted. Dahlia usually worked from her apartment. She was running some kind of internet business, so if she was leaving, it had to be really important. Well, call your date to come pick you up. You're definitely worth it, I said. You are the sweetest person in the world, Mr. Laurel, she smiled. Dahlia obviously couldn't stay angry for more than two minutes. But this is a work thing. I have to go downtown to a meeting to discuss rule changes and sign my annual tax and insurance forms. Well, then I'll take you, I said. I was just going out for a ride to clear my head so it's not a problem. When you're done, if you can't make it home with a co-worker, just call me and I'll pick you up. But it's too much trouble, she said. Honey, the thing is, when you're old and retired, because you never have anything going on, everything seems exciting, I said. Thank you very much, she said. Without you, I would be in big trouble. You're welcome, I said. She took my arm as we walked to my car. When I started the big V8, the car shook with engine vibration, as if waking up from a long sleep. Within seconds, I pulled out of my seat and left the building. Once we got on the highway, it only took me ten minutes to get to the city center. Following her instructions, when we arrived, I entered the point into the GPS. Here, I said. Why did you do that? She asked. 
In case you need me to pick you up, I can find this place from anywhere. I don't know where I'm going, I said. I'm sure I can find a ride so I don't have to bother you, Mr. Laurel, she said. Dahlia, I'm an old man. Indulge me. Give me your phone, I told her. She smiled and handed me her phone. I entered my number into it and called on my iPhone. Then he returned the phone to her. Now, if you need it, you can call me, I said, and it's really not a concern. She got out of the car and I drove away, heading back to the highway. I loved just driving the car. I preferred driving on highways rather than on streets because I didn't have to stop at traffic lights or for pedestrians. I also liked driving fast. Usually it was just me, my car, and my stereo with no distractions between us. I took advantage of Arizona's perfect February weather and let the warm night breezes flow freely into my car. In exchange, I let the loud music from my stereo penetrate the quiet of the evening as we drove. It all came down to numbers. A man in his fifties driving a car designed to look like he did 40 years ago mourned the end of his more than 30-year marriage while listening to songs that were more than 20 years old with the volume turned up to the max. This time my album of choice was Sonic Temple by The Cult. Listening to American Horse helped me focus my anger and strengthen my heart for what was to come. It is not easy to overcome the pain you feel when you find out that someone you have loved, laughed, argued, and fought for over 30 years has betrayed you. It's really not easy, but it's not impossible. I guess what made it possible was that, like I said, I love her, but I don't really like her. Perhaps we had truly grown apart over the years and this was just her way of coping. She turned to him for what she either no longer wanted from me or felt I couldn't give her. I just couldn't figure out what it could be. I was in much better shape than Dino, even though he was younger. I had much more financial resources and more free time. The only thing I could think of was that maybe he was just more willing to tolerate her. Whims and bullshit. But even that was hard to believe, because when he was done with her, he just left. He had his fun, but didn't even offer her a polite thank you. Maybe she loved him, or vice versa. I couldn't even imagine it because they didn't even kiss. This obviously wasn't the first time they'd done this. Their movements were too refined. They've done this before, and probably quite often. Then it dawned on me. That's why she started taking out the trash so often. She really thought she had deceived me, didn't she? I shook my head and laughed. I came to this realization just as Ian Asbury started singing the chorus of the song. In my head, I replaced he with she in the lyrics and sang along with Ian and Billy. She's gone crazy, completely crazy, She's trying to tame the American horse. The one I was singing about, of course, was Linda. My wife, of all these years, would be crazy if she thought I would put up with all this. And of course, if she thought that being nice to me after weeks of treating me like crap for something as stupid as taking out the trash could somehow control me, then she was definitely crazy. I, like the American horse in the song, could not be tamed or controlled. I actually started listening to the song because I think I've always seen American Horse as a metaphor for my Mustangs. It was strange how the song now reflected my feelings about my dying marriage, and he definitely died. There was no way I was going to spend the rest of my life with a woman who didn't love or respect me. Both she and Dino will get what they deserve. I pulled off at the next exit from the highway and headed back in the opposite direction. I was heading home with a new fire in my soul, and a new dose of steel in my spine when Firewoman started playing on my stereo. My foot pressed hard on the gas, and the harder I pressed, the wider my smile became. Everything started to form in my head steps that I will take in the coming days. Each new idea increased my pleasure, and then an electric current ran through my body. I quickly slowed down the car and pulled over to the side of the road. Damn, I thought I was having a heart attack, but it was just my phone. My stereo was so loud that I didn't hear the ringing. I just felt the vibration. Hello? I said. Mr. Laurel, Dahlia sobbed. Sorry to bother you, but I really need that ride, she said. I'll be right there, honey, I said. Just wait for me at the main entrance where I dropped you off. 
I returned to the highway and rushed to her location, forgetting about my torment and revenge. Once again I ran into the night, but this time I had a goal. All thoughts of my own suffering were put aside, at least for a while. Dahlia sounded terrible on the phone. It wasn't like her. She was one of the most cheerful people I knew. What could have upset her so much? As soon as I got off the highway, I turned on the GPS and quickly followed its directions. Within minutes, I was back at the building where I had taken her. She ran out to the car and sat down, as if she had just escaped from some nightmare. Home, I asked. Yes, please, she said in a quiet voice. We rode in silence, each immersed in our own thoughts. About five miles from home, her hand shot out and grabbed mine. I said nothing. I was glad to offer her some consolation. When I pulled into the garage, she breathed a sigh of relief for the first time since getting into the car. Thank you very much, she said. Dahlia, it was nothing, I said. I watched her leave. She seemed very changed. The confident, beautiful young woman I had seen just a few hours earlier had somehow turned into a very scared young girl. Dahlia, I called out to her. She turned to look at me. If you need someone to talk to, I'm always here for you, I said. She nodded and headed towards her apartment. I seriously thought about leaving, but decided that what I needed most was sleep. Tomorrow won't be as busy as I expected. It won't be filled with things to do with Linda, but it will be busy nonetheless. I entered my apartment and opened the door. Linda was watching TV. She smiled at me as I entered. I walked past her and just went to bed. I couldn't understand why she was smiling at me like that. It occurred to me after a few minutes. She didn't smile at me. She laughed at me. She did it because she didn't think I knew. Now I understand why she's been so damn nice to me lately. It was one big show for her. She ordered me to take out the trash and I refused seed, so she tried her favorite little game. She pulled out her No Sex for Stanley card and I called her bluff. I guess it was my way of showing her that her game of using sex as a weapon could no longer control me. She had to find a way to win, so she decided to just do it behind my back. She was sweet on the surface, but inside she probably thought I was going to beg her to take out the trash before she was done. Meanwhile, she was giving what she was supposed to give to me to someone else as another form of punishment. Yes, it was one big damn joke but we'll see who's laughing when the finale rolls around. That night, when Linda came to bed, she continued to move closer to me and finally began to rub her legs against me. I pretended to be so deeply asleep that it didn't wake me up. Poor Stanley, she said. You must be really tired. You won't even know what you missed. I love you, Stanley. Yes, I know, I thought. I missed out on a chance at pathetic sex from a woman I no longer cared about. And if that's your idea of love, having sex with me after you've been with some fat mechanic, I'd rather be around people who hate me. They treat me with great respect. The next morning I woke up and put on my workout clothes to go for a run. It was usually a little chilly in the morning, so I opted for running tights and a sweatshirt. Just as I was tying my shoelaces, Linda woke up. Stanley, you're awake, she said. Yes, I snapped. I do this every morning, although I'm sure you'd prefer I didn't. What are you talking about, Stanley? She asked. I've loved you for over 30 years. Do you want me to make breakfast? No, I'm going to run, I said. Why don't you run on the treadmill? She asked. Because today is a good day, I said. Stanley, we live in Arizona. Except for the middle of summer when the heat is unbearable, all the days are nice. Are you sure there's nothing you want to say or do? Yes, I said. I'll see you when I get back. She looked shocked as I walked to the door. Suddenly some pieces started to come together. Maybe Linda was laughing at me because she didn't think I knew how easy she was, but there was something else. Linda somehow found out about the bracelet I bought her. Then it dawned on me. One of her chatty friends worked at a jewelry store, so Linda probably knew about it before I even brought the damn thing home. She might even know about the dinner because I was discussing my plans with the owner of the jewelry store. Well, to hell with it. She won't get anything from me. No wonder she tried so hard to offer me a little of herself. Now it made sense. Well, Linda made sense, I thought as I ran, 
but the whole Valentine's Day idea didn't. Men are expected to spend absurd amounts of money on candy, flowers, and jewelry to get the same thing they get almost every night. What's the point? To show someone that we love them? Why not just say it? Does this mean that women don't love us? Or does it just mean that they are so horribly insecure that we need a special day to prove it? I wonder if there is a Valentine's Day card for the people you no longer love. Maybe I should create them. I could get rich. As I ran around the park, I saw many other people enjoying the sun, too. There were walkers, roller skaters, cyclists, and other runners. There were different categories of each. Some were just wandering around the park, enjoying the sun more than anything else. But a few people in each group were doing some serious training. It was fun just watching people pass by and making up stories about them. There were many beautiful women here, but most of them were too young for me. I'm just not the type to look for a young wife. But on the other hand, I think this is one of the things that I need to seriously think about. When I'm done with Linda, what will I do? Hell, I'm only in my early 50s. Although I am not young, I am still young enough to get married again. But after spending most of my life on Linda, I'm just not sure if it's even worth considering. I did a quick and easy five-mile run, enjoying both the sunshine and nice cool morning breezes and people watching. I decided that from now on, if the weather is bad or I'm recovering from an injury, I will run outside. There is no point in trying to stay or spend time with a woman who is cheating on me. As I walked back to my condominium, my mind went over all the things I needed to do again. I needed to meet with my lawyer about my divorce. I also needed to take care of some financial issues. And finally, I needed to start looking for another condo or small home. I was either going to sell the one we currently live in or just leave it to Linda. When I walked in the door, Linda was throwing a feast. She acted like it was Christmas and not Valentine's Day. Are you ready to eat, dear? She asked. She wore a sheer robe with incredible lingerie underneath. There was a tank top that must have had a built-in corset because it squeezed her waist. She still looked full, but not as much. It also lifted her sagging breasts, but it only made the stretch marks on the top of her breasts more noticeable. She put on makeup and did her hair. I'm going to take a shower and then I'll go outside, I said. Jimmy McDonald is retiring this week. I'm going to give him lunch with the guys at the plant. But Stanley, don't you remember what day it is? She asked. Yes, I said. Today is Wednesday. Stanley, today is Valentine's Day, she said, smiling. Oh, yes, I said. Happy Valentine's Day, but to be honest, I kind of forgot about it. She looked at me with bewilderment and then began to smile. Stanley, do you think I should wear something special later? I mean, did you have any plans to go out, like to a restaurant or a show? Oh, that's an idea, I said. But I guess we'll have to wait until the weekend. All the good spots are probably already booked since it's Valentine's Day. I went to the bathroom to take a shower and left her standing there with her mouth open. After I got out of the shower, I got dressed and got ready to leave. My lawyer, Ollie, was an old friend. I was sure that he would accept me without an appointment. I heard Linda talking on the phone in the other room. Arlene, he's playing some stupid game. I wish I could just tell him I already know about the bracelet and the dinner. He's really enjoying it this time. Yeah, I think it's little things like that that spice things up when you are together as long as we have. So I'll let him have his fun. Oh, gotta go, he's coming out of the shower. I waited a few minutes and then loudly grabbed my keys and opened the bedroom door. I walked into Oliver's office less than 20 minutes later. His secretary, an attractive brunette, looked up as I entered. Mr. Hardy doesn't have morning meetings that I know of, she said. Let me let him know you're here. She stood up and walked into Oliver's office, leaving me sitting there and thinking about how youth is wasted on the Jung. She showed me to Oliver's office and asked if I would like something to drink. I just smiled and said that I was fine. Inside his large office, I found Oliver playing with one of those putting machines. This won't help you, asshole, I said. You can barely hit the ball 80 yards on your best day. Improving your putting isn't the problem. You need to get exercise and get the strength back in those arms. Shut up, Stanley, he chuckled. Just because you have nothing better to do doesn't mean you can come here and bother hardworking people while they're at work. 
Oh, please excuse me, I said sarcastically. I didn't know I was in the office of Oliver Hardy, the professional golfer. I thought it was my corrupt lawyer's office. So what do you want this corrupt lawyer to do for you, sir? He asked with exaggerated formality. He hasn't taken his eyes off his golf ball since I walked in. He leveled his shot and raised his club. Just finalize my divorce, I said the moment he struck. His shock at what I had just said made him hit much harder than he had planned. The ball skittered across the floor, bounced off the ramp built into his putting green, and flew across the room. It hit the computer monitor on his desk and cracked it. What? He said. Oliver was my best man at my wedding. He visited our house so often that it seemed as if he lived there. He was my daughter's godfather and executor of my will. Damn, Stanley, he said. Stop making jokes. You owe me a new monitor. I almost died of a heart attack. I'm not kidding, Ollie, I said. But why, Stan? He asked. He looked almost as bad as if it concerned him. All marriages go through ups and downs. You just have to get through the rough patch. Things will get better. Any other decision is worse, Stan. Oh, I said. I thought watching her have sex with the guy who does maintenance at our condo in an alley by the dumpsters was the worst thing that could happen. So tell me what could be worse. Crap, he said. You need to get rid of this bitch. I didn't know. Who knows what disease she could give you? And I'm not just talking about STDs. There's so much scary bacteria around the trash. Damn. Whatever you do, don't have sex with her. So how do I start this? I asked. It's already started, he said. You hired me. I'll start drawing up the paperwork. We'll come up with a fair agreement for both parties. Then she'll be notified. She'll get a lawyer. And we'll all sit down and agree on something. Most of these cases never go to trial. What do you mean fair for both sides? I asked. I've heard terrible things about divorce. Damn, Stan, you've been married to her for what, 30 years? He asked. We'll probably have to split everything in half no matter who did what. I looked at him like he was crazy. Screw it, I said. I thought you were supposed to be a crooked lawyer. The same kind of crap I could find on the internet. Stop thinking we're both your friends. We need to figure out a way to keep this bitch from getting a quarter. Stanley, he said, looking at me. Okay, I said. She can take a quarter, but no more. Stanley, this is illegal, he said. Even in the worst cases, the judge will probably give her at least 40% of your estate. A quarter is only 25%. No way, I said. You're wrong with the numbers. I was talking about 25 cents, not 25% of the money I wasted all my life while she sat on her fat ass eating bonbons. Before I give her that much money, I'd better just leave. There's no way I'm paying her for ditching me. He looked at me as if he was seeing me for the first time. Let's look for loopholes, I said. Can I legally sell my apartment? Is her name on the purchase documents? He asked. No, I said. Then I guess technically you can. But if we ever go to court over this, it could get really messy. Is there a law that says married people must live together? I asked. No, he said. You're supposed to want to live with the person you marry. But there's no law that forces you to live with someone. Is there a law that says I have to divorce her? I asked. No, there is no such thing, he said. But if you just disappear, she might divorce you and then you'll still have to give her half of your property. Okay. What if the apartment is all our property and I give it to her? I asked. He shook his head and thought before answering. We spent the rest of the morning like that before breaking for lunch. My goal was to figure out a way to get rid of Linda with minimal damage to our property. Maybe it was wrong of me to want to do this to a woman I lived with and loved for over 30 years who would end up homeless and impoverished. But hey, I'm human too. On the way to my car, I hummed my new theme song, If Lying to You is Wrong, I Don't Want to Be Right. There were a few other things Ollie and I talked about besides getting rid of Linda. We also discussed what to do with Dino. Pain and suffering were on the way for him too, but the timing had to be right. If I get to Dino before Linda, she'll know something's going on. I needed to transfer money and complete all financial transactions before I filed a claim against Linda, and Dino could be sorted out during the cleanup. On the way home, 
I transferred half the money from my savings and investment accounts to new accounts that did not have Linda's name on them. I also went to the plant and removed Linda's name from my insurance policies and removed her from my retirement account. In our state, if I died, she would still receive benefits unless I specifically excluded her from my will. The idiot in the accounting department asked me a bunch of damn questions about why I was doing this. I told him that she started her own business and makes the same amount as me, so she doesn't need it. You can never have too much money, he said. He smiled at me in such a way that I wanted to strangle him right there. He then gave me a form for Linda to sign. I couldn't believe this nonsense. She actually had to sign a form to be removed from my retirement account. I've been hauling my ass to this plant for 27 years. Linda had probably only been there a few times during our entire life together. I just smiled at him and took the damn uniform. I've already decided how to get her to sign it. I had another form from Ollie that she also had to sign. This form added Linda's name as the owner of the apartment. I gave up the idea of kicking her out. I was going to leave on my own. Only, since I didn't give her money, she would lose her apartment and her credit would be ruined because she wouldn't be able to make payments. Our apartment cost over $100,000. I was going to refinance it and borrow on our entire property from it. Then I would move out and leave Linda alone with her problems. I was also about to make some questionable business moves that would result in the loss of most of our cash and investments. I won't start touching my retirement fund until I'm 65, which would give me about 13 years. Hopefully, Linda will be dead by then, just in case the law decides to give her some of it. As I walked back to the apartment, I was almost cheerful considering the last 24 hours I had been through. I was smart enough to realize that I was still in shock from what was happening to me, and that soon, perhaps very soon, the reality of the situation would hit me, and I didn't know how I would handle it. After I locked the car in the parking lot, I saw Dino looking at me. He had the same smile on his face that he always had. Only now do I know why. Cool car, Mr. Laurel, he said. I ignored him and continued walking. Before I got to the apartment, I changed my mind. I turned and walked in the other direction and knocked on Dahlia's door. She opened the door through a crack a few minutes later. I already told you I don't have anything that needs fixing or checking. If the situation changes, I will call you. Please leave me alone, she said. Sorry, Dahlia. I just wanted to make sure you were okay, I said. She opened the door wider. No, sorry, Mr. Laurel, she said. I thought you were someone else. Would you like to come in? Only if it won't be a burden to you, I said. No, it's always nice to see a friendly face, she said. I entered her apartment. She offered me a seat on the sofa and told me to wait a few minutes while she got dressed. When she left, I decided to do something for her to cheer her up. I always took out my iPhone and called the flower shop. I told the woman at the flower shop who I was. She remembered me because my order was quite large, but also because when the occasion called for it, I ordered flowers for Linda from her store. I asked her if she had sent the flowers to Linda yet, and she told me that I had asked for them to be delivered later that day, so they would probably go out on the next delivery. I asked her to deliver flowers to another apartment in the same complex and tell the driver that if he got them there within the hour, he would get a big tip. Since the flowers were addressed only to the lady of the house, nothing else needed to be changed. Ten minutes later, Dahlia returned to the living room. She seemed a little more relaxed, but still not at ease. What's happened? I asked. Where do I begin? She asked. Sorry about earlier. I thought you were that idiot Dino. He hangs around my door all the time. He knocks on the door at least once a day, saying he needs to come in and check on things but he never finds them. And when I asked the other residents, none of them talked about checking these things. I think he's just some kind of pervert. She looked at my face when she mentioned Dino's name. I think my facial expression gives something away. You don't like him either, do you? She asked. I hate that bastard, I said, harsher than I intended. I'm so sorry, she said. So you know, right? I probably should have said something, but... I accidentally ran into them when I was taking out the trash a couple weeks ago. They were so busy that they didn't even notice me. I just left my trash bags at the building. He's such a pig. And I can't believe Mrs. Laurel... 
Yeah, there's a lot going on that I never would have thought, I said. You look so calm, she said. Only outside, I said. I'm like mush inside. I'm just trying to move so it can't really affect me until it's over. When did you find out? She asked. Yesterday, I said sadly. Nothing has been the same since then. The whole world seems different. If you don't mind me asking, she said carefully, what are you going to do? I'm going to go for the big D, I said. Please don't say anything because I want it to be a surprise for both of them, but it's in the works. But don't you need to know why she did it? Maybe she was forced. Have you thought about what your life will be like when my grandfather died? It was like my grandmother died too. That was over five years ago, and she's just starting to come to her senses. For a woman her age, my grandmother is beautiful, but she just couldn't imagine life without him. What will you do? She asked. No, I said. There was no violence. She started first. At least that's what it was yesterday when I saw them, and I'll be fine alone. I'm young enough to start over if I need company. But really, I'll be better off alone than being forced to stay with a woman who doesn't really want to be with me, or one who lies to me. I'm sure she loves you, she said. Perhaps, like many women these days, she just wanted something on the side. One of my friends was engaged to a medical student. In about a year, he would graduate and get a great job in one of the hospitals. They were together for more than four years, but she barely saw him. So on the nights when she felt especially lonely, she, um, turned to someone else. I don't know how, maybe someone told someone, but anyway he found out about it and broke off the engagement. She went crazy and stalked him and tried to tell him it didn't mean anything. He had to get a restraining order. He ended up now dating a girl who works in the hospital billing department. We heard that they might get married soon, but my friend never got over it. She still loves him and keeps trying all stupid ways to get him back. I guess love and sex aren't necessarily linked these days, she said. To me, they are connected, I said. And for me, unfortunately, too, she said. That's good, I said. You'll be happier in the long run. Oh, I'm sure of it, she said. I still have a year and a half of school ahead of me, and since last night I have no way to pay my bills. Once my savings run out, sorry, I'll be screwed with no rowing. What happened last night? I asked. Mr. Laurel, last night I came to fill out paperwork for the new owners of the company I work for. One of the owners saw me and decided he liked me or something. He made me an offer that I was forced to accept. Refuse. He was just disgusting. He's some fat old man in his forties with a big belly, too much hair on his chest and a lot of cheap gold chains. When I said no, he pointed out that I might lose my job. I said anyway, no. That's why you were upset, I said. What was your profession? She looked at the floor. No comment, she said. It's not something I want to talk about, but it's honest work and it's legal. I looked at my watch. We still had about five minutes before the deadline set by the florist. I'm hungry, I said. Mr. Laurel, I could cook something, she said. I'm not the best cook, but I can do a lot. Actually, Dahlia, I was hoping that we could go to lunch together. We could share our grief and maybe find solutions to our common problems together. I would be glad, she said. I'm really not a very good cook. I try, but I just don't have the cooking gene. I laughed when she said that. It took Linda a long time to learn how to cook, too, I said. She almost poisoned me a couple of times, but I loved her so much I didn't care. Just remembering how much I loved Linda when we first started dating struck me as if someone had just punched me in the heart. I think up to this point I had only considered Linda as she had become over the years, rather than the beautiful young woman I fell in love with many years ago. Sorry, she said. Did I say something wrong? No, Dahlia, I said. I just remembered Linda as she was. We went to a small Italian restaurant that was just a few blocks from our apartment complex. We had a pleasant conversation, which washed away some of my growing depression over what was happening in my life. I think all those old sayings about grief-loving company can be interpreted in different ways. We were both unhappy, but our communication lifted our spirits. Finally, around three o'clock in the afternoon, I drove us home. As I pulled into the parking structure, 
I saw a teenager drive in front of Dahlia's apartment and quickly walk towards her door. We arrived just as he was placing flowers at her doorstep. Dahlia's face lit up with a smile. We'll see, she said. I know these are not from my grandmother. So who are they from? She looked at me and smiled. The delivery man returned to the door. Do you want to sign for them? He asked with enthusiasm. Dahlia signed his clipboard and returned it to him. I think I heard something about tipping, he hinted. It looks like it should be a big tip, I said. What's the biggest tip you've ever received? A thousand bucks, said the boy. You lie like you breathe, I said, making Dahlia laugh. Okay, the biggest tip I ever got was twenty bucks, he said. I was going to give you fifty, I said. But you should have delivered these flowers two hours ago. The tip was if you delivered the flowers within an hour after I hung up on my boss. Damn, he said. That's why she put your flowers in the back of the truck. They had to be delivered first. And that's why you didn't get your tip, I said. His face immediately took on the expression of an offended puppy. But look at it this way. You got something much more valuable than money. You got experience. You learned the wrong way to do a job. Now, in the future, you will do things better and more organized. Experience is a good teacher. Wow, thank you, mister, he said sadly. I'll immediately run to Best Boy and see how many Xbox games I can buy with the experience. Maybe I can take my girlfriend to a restaurant with my experience. I wish you a happy Valentine's Day. Dahlia smiled at me and also stuck out her lips. Okay, I said, but I still won't give you 50. I gave him 20 bucks and he was happy and so was Dahlia. I felt good too. Dahlia kissed me on the cheek and told me I made her Valentine's Day happy. I returned to my apartment at 3.15. Linda was there and she was furious. She looked at me when I entered. Where have you been? She asked. Linda, I told you where I was going, I replied. I have some papers you need to sign. Why should I sign the papers? She asked. Because, Linda, I'm going to die someday, I said. No, you won't die, she chuckled. You will live forever with the way you run and play sports. Your body is some kind of machine. Linda, healthy men die every day from heart attacks or cancer. They get into accidents and stuff. When I bought this apartment, I signed the papers alone. I'm updating my will and notice that your name is not on the documents for the apartment. If, if something happens to me, you might get kicked out of here and the place might be resold. Or you might not be able to sell it if you need money for medical bills or something. Are you really thinking about what would happen to me if you... She began. Darling, nothing will happen to you because I will never let that happen. We argue sometimes and most of the time it's over really stupid things. But, Stanley, sometimes you surprise me. You really love me, don't you? You'd be surprised at the amount of love I have for you, Linda, I said. I was sure that negative numbers couldn't be that low without a special calculator. I put the papers on the table, and Linda, as I expected, signed them all, including the one I slipped between the sheets of papers for the apartment. Linda just made herself responsible for paying off the loan I took out against our condo property and also signed herself out of receiving any money from my retirement plan. She signed them only to move on to the next set of questions. So, Stanley, do you remember what I told you this morning? She asked. Oh, damn, I said. Linda, give me a couple of minutes. I need to go to the office. I went into our home office and opened Microsoft Publisher on our computer. I looked through greeting card templates and made Linda a Valentine's Day card. I spelled her name wrong on purpose to make her really angry. A few minutes later, I returned to the living room. With the biggest, rawest smile I could find, I handed her the card. Happy Valentine's Day, honey, I said. She had a look on her face like she had just bitten into a fried shit sandwich. Her mouth fell open and she looked at me with a mixture of anger and bewilderment. Who is Limdy? She asked. You see, that's the problem, I said. Five minutes ago, you were sure I loved you. And now because my old fingers pressed the wrong keys, you're angry. Fuck it. That's why I hate Valentine's Day and all these other Hallmark holidays. The guy just can't win. I went into the bedroom and slammed the door behind me. 
I lay down in bed to take a nap, holding back the urge to laugh. A few minutes after I got into bed, Linda opened the door and looked at me. Once she was sure I was asleep, she returned to the living room, and I heard her talking on the phone. No, he hasn't given me anything yet, she said. Wait, wait. Well, he gave me some lame Valentine's Day card that looked like he made it with pencils. He even spelled my name wrong. What? Of course I didn't receive any flowers and he didn't mention the restaurant. Are you sure your boss said he made a reservation for us? What do you mean he can test me? Ah, I get it. He's trying to make me angry, and then he'll just take my gifts. Okay, two can play this game. A few minutes later, the door opened and Linda got into bed with me. She hugged me and started kissing me. I was terrified, but I didn't intend to be betrayed. I turned over in the opposite direction and mumbled, Leave me alone. I'm tired. She actually sat up in bed. Stanley, are you okay? She looked at me like she really cared. Maybe her brain was just working. There's something wrong here, she said. This is the second time you've refused sex. Linda, over the last month or so since we started arguing about this and you told me it would be a long time before we had sex, I've started focusing on different things, I said. There are certain things I want to do before I die, and I need to start doing them. I probably overdid it by running this morning, so I'm really tired. Her eyes widened and she stared at me. Stanley, is there anything I should know about? She asked. Have you been to the doctor lately? What's on your list? Maybe I could help you with some of them. How long do we have? Then it dawned on me. The stupid fool thought I was dying and I had a last-minute wish list. She came back to me a couple more times during the evening. Um, Stanley, do you want to go out to dinner or something? She asked one day. I'm tired, I said. Stanley, darling, do you remember what day it is? She asked. It's Valentine's Day and it's almost over. Thank God, I said. Now everything can go back to normal. Stanley, are we doing anything for Valentine's Day? She asked with irritation. I already gave you a card, didn't I? I said. She slammed the door so hard that the whole house shook. She returned to bed around midnight, wearing a nightgown so thick I thought she was wearing armor. She stayed as far away from me as the size of the bed would allow and tried to take all the blankets from me. She was so angry that I thought she might explode in anger. I barely managed to stop myself from laughing. I woke up early the next morning and got ready for my morning run. While I was in the kitchen getting a quick snack before going for a run, Linda came into the room. Good morning, dear, I said cheerfully. Stanley, where is my bracelet? She shouted. What happened to the restaurant and my damn flowers? Linda, are you high? I asked. What are you talking about? Someone told me that you went to a jewelry store and bought me a bracelet for Valentine's Day and made a reservation at my favorite restaurant, she said. But all you gave me was that stupid homemade card. I pretended to be offended and looked at her. At least I put some effort into the card, Linda, I said. What did you give me? I tried to give you what you keep begging for, she said. What? I asked. Let's figure it out. I should spend almost $3,000 on a brand new bracelet, studded with diamonds. Pay another $200 for a custom engraving on the back. Leave at least $300 for dinner at that snooty French restaurant I don't even like and then, and spend a hundred or so on fresh flowers. I buy you all these fresh and new things, and you want to give me your fifty-year-old self. How is that fair? Her mouth was open again, but she didn't know what to say. Linda, I'm old enough to understand that there's more to life than sex. Moreover, waiting and begging for sex with a woman who doesn't enjoy it, or is trying to use it as a means to achieve her goals, instead so that this is an expression of our feelings for each other. She wanted to say something, but the words could not be found. So don't worry about it, I continued. Since sex with you is no longer a priority, you no longer have power over me, so why would I spend that kind of money on you? Mentioning the cost of the bracelet she wanted only convinced her that I had actually bought it. She will probably tear the house apart looking for him, but won't find him because he is no longer in the house. I walked past her and went out for my morning jog. When I returned from my run, I tried to get Dahlia a job with a friend of mine who was looking for an assistant. 
It wasn't a high-paying job, but she was excited about the opportunity. Linda and I found ourselves on very frosty terms for the next few weeks. I followed her as she took out the trash several times and caught her on video on the iPhone app. I assumed that a video of her having fun on the hood of Dino's car more than once would be more than enough proof that our marriage was over. As I watched the second video, I realized that I would need to make a third one because the second incident would not help my case. It can even cause harm. She is called Dino Stanley. He didn't care what she called him, and neither did I. By the time I made the third video, I knew it was time for me to leave. I transferred all the money from all my bank accounts. I found a new apartment just two miles away and bought all the personal items needed to make the place cozy. I even invited Dahlia a couple of times. Then she told me what she used to do. My beautiful, young Dahlia was a phone sex operator. Oh, how we talked after that. Especially when I learned that Dahlia, who had seduced countless men over the phone and helped them achieve satisfaction, was a 22-year-old virgin. That evening, Linda got up to take out the trash. When she took the bag and told me, I'm going to take out the trash, I smiled and replied, bye. God, Stanley, she said, it's like you don't care at all. Linda, are you sure you don't want me to carry it for you? I asked. I can handle it, Stanley, she said. Okay, I laughed. That was the last time I saw Linda for a long time. When Linda returned to our condo that night, I was gone. I left a few things in places where I knew she would find them. I left the bag from the jewelry store in the linen closet. It still had the receipt for the bracelet. Linda tried to call me that night and over the next few days. I simply did not answer her calls or accept her messages. My daughter called me and I spoke to her, but I said I would not discuss her mother or our situation. Now, when I look back, I think it was a mistake, because when things really got tough, my daughter had to choose a side in the war, and she chose mom over me. This hurt me the most, because we had always been very close. A few weeks later, when the first payment on her apartment loan came due, Linda realized she was in a deep hole. She had already discovered that I had left her only $24 in the bank, a dollar for every good year of our marriage. I wish I could explain it to her, but it had to be one of those subtle jokes that gets lost when you tell it to someone else. Linda tried to borrow money from each of her friends. She even tried to borrow money from Dino, only to find out that Dino had been fired. I sued the company that owns our condo for the behavior of their employees. To sort things out, they gave me money to just leave. They also fired Dino. When Linda went to Dino to ask for a loan, she learned that he had been fired, but did not know why. Dino wasn't home when she came to his door. Dino was in the hospital. Apparently, several teenagers who didn't live in our area beat Dino to a pulp. Linda never learned the full extent of Dino's injuries. She was too busy trying to find money to cover her loan payments. As a result, she was evicted. Linda continued to try to explain to the finance company that I was the holder of the loan. They explained to her that they had a contract that she signed, taking over the loan and the condo. When she looked at the documents with the lawyer, he told her that she was stupid to sign them, but now nothing could be done about it. He begged her to file for divorce so she could get some of our assets. He arranged a meeting with Ollie and presented documents with their version of the separation agreement. Linda hoped that I would be at the meeting so we could talk. Ollie explained to them that I was in rehab for alcohol and illegal substances. It was true. Ollie personally took me there. Only I was there for a week for a seminar to learn how to deal with stress in my life. Ollie told them that I had lost most of our money through gambling and bad investments. He had all the papers that confirmed this. It cost me $10,000 for letters demanding payment from several casinos, but it was worth it. Ollie explained to Linda that she was making the right choice because when the casinos started going after me, they could try to get money from her too if we were still legally married. Her lawyer raised the issue of my pension plan. Ollie pulled out a paper which Linda signed, removing herself from the plan. Then Linda realized she was in trouble. She signed a no-contest divorce agreement to avoid having to help me with my debts, and in three months, I will be a free man. Linda moved in with my daughter and her husband. That's how I lost my daughter. Amber really thought I had just gone crazy, started drinking and gambling, and just abandoned her mother for no reason. 
leaving her alone and without a livelihood. Linda was never the same after that. According to several mutual friends that I kept in touch with, she would sit at Amber's house and constantly look through our old photo albums. She gained a few extra pounds, and her life moved on. I don't think she ever got over what happened, and I'm sure she never took responsibility for it. On the other hand, everything has changed for me. Although we never had the big confrontation that seems to drive so many divorce stories, my life became fuller and more fulfilling. I joined several volunteer groups and clubs. I had one group. That was mostly middle-aged singles who did nothing but travel. The group had a website where they posted trips, directions, costs, and how much we saved by buying and booking accommodations in bulk. I also had my daily runs and workouts. I ran a few short races and won my age group. So far, I seemed to be limiting myself to five kilometers. I decided that maybe in the summer I would try to run 10 kilometers, but in the back of my mind, I knew I wanted to run a marathon. It wasn't a question of if or why. It was simply a question of when. My daily runs became more and more varied. I quickly realized that at my age, I couldn't just go out and give it my all every day. My typical pattern became to spend most of my runs at an easy pace and do one or two harder days per week. Even what I did these days varied. Some days I would go to the stadium and do a traditional speed workout. Other days I might replace the intervals with hill reps. Sundays, although I didn't have any race in mind yet, became my long run day. I built up my distance very slowly. I spent my evenings either lying at home, watching TV, or simply driving around, exploring the surrounding area. I had a cleaning lady who came twice a week to clean things up. She often cooked for me and stayed for dinner with me a couple of times. She was a middle-aged woman, about 35 years old, and she was quite attractive. We exchanged awkward glances a couple of times and I was sure there was a possibility of starting some kind of relationship, be it purely sexual or perhaps something more, but I never started anything. From my point of view, if I started something with someone I didn't love, just to avoid loneliness or be alone, then there would be no point in getting rid of Linda. Besides, there is a very big difference between loneliness and being alone. I was alone, but I had more than enough people in my life to not feel alone. At this point in my life, I was single by choice, but it seemed like everyone on the planet except me thought it was either abnormal or just the wrong choice. Everyone I met always had a friend they wanted to introduce me to. Over the months, Dahlia became my best friend and biggest advocate. She was the one who put me back together when my daughter cut all ties with me. Amber was still convinced that I had simply left her mother and left her destitute for no reason. She also thought that I had become an alcoholic and had developed a gambling addiction. I had lunch with Dahlia two or three times a week, and we often had dinner together. We went to the movies and did other things that neither of us wanted to do alone. There was nothing romantic between us. Dahlia was a beautiful young woman, but unlike stories on the internet, our almost 30-year age difference simply did not allow anything romantic to arise. She was like a replacement for the daughter I lost, and I was, for her, the father figure that she never had in her life. One day during dinner, it started. Stanley, do you ever feel lonely? She asked me. No, never, I said. My life is so full that I simply don't have time to feel lonely. Plus, when I want to go out and do something, there is this wonderful young woman who goes to movies and dinners with me. She's beautiful? She asked. Beautiful doesn't even begin to describe her, I said. She is probably one of the most beautiful young women on the planet. She looks more like my daughter than the real one. Her smile lit up the restaurant. Stanley, do you trust her? She asked. Of course, I said. Well, good, because she's been thinking and thinking lately that she has someone in mind for you. Honey, please don't start, I began. I don't need it either. I'm just not ready for this yet. I had just gotten out of a 30-year relationship that was sucking the life out of me towards the end. I needed to free myself to maintain my self-respect. I just want to be happy being myself for a while, okay? Well, when you're ready, let me know, she said. A couple of days after this conversation, it happened. I was running in the park. It was one of my easier days, and the sun was shining. I knew every step of the trail in that park because I'd been running there almost every morning since I'd just broken up with Linda. 
In the months that followed, the park became almost part of my home. I knew which trees I could hide under if it started to rain lightly, and even the ideal places to run my intervals if I was too lazy to drive to the stadium. She didn't look out of place because, in fact, it seemed like my park was her place. She felt free there from the first time I saw her. She was one of those women who simply ignored age. She was slim, but not overly thin. Older women who are very thin have a tendency to look unhealthy or even bony. It looks like they could break a hip just by standing up. This woman could be from her early 40s to her early 60s, but she had this healthy glow. Her smile for everyone she met was contagious. Her figure was incredible. Her legs were long and slender, and she still had a nice butt. This is rare for women over 40. Most of them either have a big fat ass dripping with cellulite or no ass at all. She, although not large, was very well formed and proportional. It was, in a word, perfect for her body. Her breasts, again, although not large, were very attractive. There were just enough to keep her interested, but not so many that she ever had to worry about them sagging. She had a heart-shaped face that seemed oddly familiar, even though I had never seen her before in my life. With every lap that I ran around the park, she became more and more interesting to me. Her training was as varied as she was. She seemed to do whatever she liked. While I was constantly running around the park, getting a good sweat in and maintaining my fitness, she seemed to just do whatever she liked. She ran the first lap I ran, and although not as fast as me, she had a decent stride and a good pace. The next time I saw her, she was standing in a group of flowers and seemed intent on smelling each one to see if they smelled the same. The next time I saw her, she was running slowly with another woman, and they were deep in animated conversation. The next time, she actually walked at a brisk pace and carried a hug of flowers from the edge of a small pond in the park. It was in that circle that I almost died, in that circle when she turned her head a little and smiled at me. I know that at 54 I'm too young for old age moments, but when she directed that smile at me, I lost track of time and space. I've never felt this way before. Never in its more than half a century of existence has any event made such an impression on me. I ran off the path that I knew so well that I could run along it in the dark with my eyes closed, and I crashed into a tree. Several people in the area clearly and audibly laughed at me. I stood up and started running again, and a quick glance over my shoulder rewarded me with a vision that I still carry in my memory. I just loved seeing her with her hand over her mouth to cover her obvious surprise. But the joy written in her eyes destroyed me forever. She was crazy. So many things about it just didn't make sense. Her hair wasn't very short or very long, but it was so vibrant and vibrant. It was like a page boy cut that she let grow until it almost touched her shoulders. And it wasn't really gray hair, it was silvery white. Why the hell didn't she paint them? Linda started coloring her hair when she first started turning gray. If this woman had dyed her hair, she could easily pass for a 30-year-old. But she seemed to be proud of her years. There was not a single wrinkle on her face, and her skin was very smooth. And it wasn't just her face or her body. Everything about her simply defied categorization. Even her training, if you can call it that. Again, like most people in the park, I was doing the same thing. I went out and ran. I did specific exercises aimed at improving my fitness in certain areas, such as endurance, speed, or strength. She seemed to move from one activity to another in ways that defied common sense, but their effectiveness was undeniable. It was as if her entire plan was designed not only to train the body, but also the soul. She sat in piles of flowers or ran with the children according to her mood and she rewarded everyone around her with her incredible smiles. I was sure it would have been worth crashing into the tree again on the next lap if she had given me another one. My run was technically over, but I decided to run a couple more laps just to take another look at her. Unfortunately, when I returned, she was no longer there. I had lunch with Dahlia that day and couldn't contain myself. What makes you so happy? she asked. Dahlia? I saw the most beautiful woman I have ever seen besides you in the park today, I said. Dahlia's eyes narrowed slightly. No, I didn't, she said coldly. Didn't you tell me less than a month ago that you weren't ready to date someone? Well, yeah, I said. 
Dahlia, I haven't met her. I just saw her. She was just, I don't know, special. I'll probably never see her again. I didn't even really talk to her. So you ran into some girl in the park and now all of a sudden your salmon are ready to swim upstream, she said angrily. Darling, I started trying to prevent the situation from getting worse. Don't call me darling Stanley, she said. I have plans for you. What? I said. Stanley, I love you, she said. My heart started beating. I want you in my life. I want you to settle down and build a life with someone who will love you the way you deserve. It was a nightmare. Dahlia was beautiful, but she was too young for me. This was my life, not one of those stories where some old man finds a woman who is too young for him, and they end up getting married and living happily ever after because he is good to her. When you read these stories, do you ever wonder what the hell they have in common besides love? Hell, I love my car, but I'm not going to marry it. What do these types of couples talk about? Let's see. A guy in his 50s probably remembers Van Halen when they were at their peak. A girl in her 20s probably thinks Britney Spears' music is oldies and doesn't even know that Madonna isn't actually British. What the hell do they have in common? And what will they do in a few years when he will no longer be able to move much and she will be full of energy and desires? Dahlia, honey, I said, I love you too. But I love you like a daughter. You're just too young for me. Dahlia scrunched up her beautiful heart-shaped face and lowered her head. Her long, silky hair covered her face, and when she looked up again, she burst into laughter. She laughed for about five minutes straight and then looked at me again with tears running down her cheeks. It was a real blow to my pride. Of course I am, Stanley, she said, smiling. I want you to meet my grandmother. She is several years older than you, but this is part of my evil plan to make the two most important people to me happy. And guess what? I feel the same for you as you feel for me. That's why I really want things to work out between you and my grandma. Because then you could actually be part of my family. But you are already part of my heart. Her kind words did a lot to soothe my bruised pride. I told her that just because I felt attracted to one woman didn't mean I was ready for another relationship. But when I'm ready to start dating, I'll let her know. Stanley, she said. Until then... You and I will still go on dates, right? She smiled at me and it reminded me of something, but I couldn't remember what. I simply nodded and smiled back. Over the next few weeks, Dahlia kept talking about her grandmother and I continued to refuse. I just imagined some cheerful old lady with a heart of gold. If you imagine Mrs. Claus, you'll see what I mean. She was probably as sweet as the day was long and about as sexy as Teddy Bear. I assumed that with Dahlia in her 20s, her mom was probably in her early to mid-40s, which would put Grandma in her mid-60s or possibly early 70s. Even if the Mrs. Claus analogy was wrong, it just didn't make sense. Damn, Betty White is sexy in her own way, but I wasn't ready for it yet. I needed to find a way to explain this to Dahlia gently. Meanwhile, I continued to search the park every day, but I never saw my dreamy woman again. In fact, my disappointment at not seeing her began to overwhelm me. Finally, I let Dahlia talk me into agreeing to meet her old grandmother. I decided that we would go out to dinner or something, and then I would tell her, or maybe Grandma could tell her, that we each think the other is very cute, but there is no chemistry. I had to do it because this dinner with Grandma was everything Dahlia wanted for her birthday. I made a reservation at a very nice restaurant and got ready. It's funny, but that day I was feeling a little depressed because the next day was my anniversary with Linda. At least I didn't have to buy that cow a gift this year. I also had a hard time accepting that it had been nine months since our divorce and almost eleven months since I caught her with Dino at the dumpsters. I rarely thought about those days. I didn't know if it was because I had pushed them out of my mind to avoid pain or because my life was so much better now. I gave Dahlia a ride to the restaurant in my Mustang. Her grandmother was supposed to meet us there. I was completely ready for the meeting. I wanted Grandma to love me because I had truly come to consider Dahlia my daughter and her grandmother was important to her. I didn't want Grandma to dislike me because I really wanted Dahlia to continue to be a part of my life. Dahlia and I were already seated and ordered appetizers. 
She called her grandmother and found out that her grandmother was late. Dahlia told me that grandma's mind was still razor sharp, but she had reached an age where she no longer cared. She was in no hurry. I just did everything at my own pace. Today, for example, she was helping people plant flowers and simply lost track of time. In my mind's eye, I pictured some wobbly, slobbering old lady in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. But I was determined to make a good impression on the old lady for Dahlia's sake. Then the worst possible thing happened. I was looking for a waiter to order a drink and saw her out of the corner of my eye. There was no doubt who it was. It was the woman from the park. I've been thinking about her obsessively for weeks, and now she's showing up at the worst possible time and place. What will Dahlia think if I leave her and Grandma? The woman walked to the other side of the restaurant. Well, at least I didn't have to sit here and look at her while trying to focus on Dahlia and Grandma. However, after a few seconds, I realized that I had a problem. I was dying to know who she was here with. She is married? Is she here with a man? I needed to find out. So I excused myself and headed to the other side of the restaurant. I could always pretend that I was looking for the toilet, although it was on our side of the hall. I looked around the whole room and didn't find her. I looked at every table. I was on the verge of looking stupid, so I walked back to our table. I almost died of a heart attack when I got there. The woman from the park was sitting in my place talking to Dahlia. Um, sorry, but you're sitting in my seat, I said. She looked up at me, and it happened again. Her eyes were some strange combination of different shades of blue. I almost missed what she said because I was so busy looking at her. She smiled at me, too. The next thing I remember is Dahlia snapping her fingers. Will this be a problem? She asked. It's just a chair, damn it. Grandma and I both looked at her strangely. What? I asked. What the hell is going on? Asked Dahlia. Sorry, D. Grandma said, smiling. Sorry, Dahlia said, but you both have been acting strange, and I want this evening to go well. It's my D. It's my birthday. Stanley, do you remember that woman from the park I told you about? I began. That unfortunate girl because of whom you suddenly went crazy after seeing her just once? Asked Dahlia. I thought you had already forgotten about her. No, I said. I couldn't get her out of my head. I have returned to the park every day since then, hoping to see her again. Oh, damn, Dahlia said. Stanley, why didn't you tell me it was so serious? I didn't know she made such an impression on you. If I had known, I would never have tried to arrange this. She made a big impression on him, too, said the grandmother, although not as big as the one in that tree. She laughed again, and I just looked at her. Her smile and sparkling eyes were simply mesmerizing. She would return to that park every day if she lived in this city. She was there that day only to drop off a check and visit her beloved granddaughter. But she learned that there was nothing to worry about because someone else was doing well. Took care of her granddaughter. Someone looked out for her and even found her another job and cheered her up when she needed it. Are we all having the same godforsaken conversation? Dahlia asked. Dahlia, your grandmother is the same woman I saw in the park, I said. Dahlia looked at both of us, looking back and forth as if trying to keep track of the ball in a tennis match. So you two, she began. Do you like each other? Answered her grandmother, still smiling at me. Very, I added. The rest of the evening was magical. Dahlia's grandmother, Margaret, and I got to know each other better. We discussed everything we could while Dahlia just watched and smiled. I wondered how she could be a grandmother looking so young, and she smiled again. Linda, at 49, is five years younger than me, and Margaret must be much younger than Linda. Then I learned that Margaret, at 56, was two years older than me. She told me the whole story of her life. She married very young and had a child at 20. Dahlia's mom was a rebel and got into trouble at a very young age. She gave birth to Dahlia and quickly ran away, never to be heard from again. Dahlia was raised by her grandparents. Six years ago, Dahlia's grandfather was killed on a construction site. Grandma was left alone all this time. She didn't go on dates or even look at anyone. I just didn't want to. Dahlia filled her head with stories about me, and Margaret decided that for Dahlia's birthday, she would at least come and meet me. 
Dahlia and I told her the story of my divorce and the reasons for it. By that time, the waiters were already politely making it clear that the restaurant would be closing soon. Margaret and I were leaning across the table, holding hands, and Dahlia was smiling from ear to ear. But we didn't even dance, I said. We still have a lot of time for this, said Margaret. If you don't mind being seen with an old lady. If I could choose, I would never want to be seen with another woman for the rest of my life, I said. This brought out another one of Margaret's incredible smiles. Um, Stanley, what about me? Dahlia asked. Over the next few weeks, Margaret began traveling back and forth between her home state of Tennessee and Arizona, so often that she eventually simply moved in with Dahlia. A few weeks after that, it was obvious that she wasn't spending much time at Dahlia's, so she moved in with me. If I thought I was happy in my life after my divorce from Linda, it was nothing compared to waking up every morning with Margaret in my arms. I walked around so happy that I could have exploded at any moment because my body was simply not designed to contain that much happiness. So, of course, what had to happen happened. Fate decided that she needed to get serious and deep into my cereal. Margaret and I walked holding hands down the aisle of our local Kroger store. We just moved into a small but cozy house on the outskirts of the desert. The area was perfect. We were only ten miles from Dahlia on the highway. We were able to design the house exactly how we wanted, with a small pool and a deck in the back where we could sit together and watch the sunrises and sunsets. We also had a large, comfy, double-covered hammock bed in the back for long, cozy naps. Life was good. So, we were at Kroger. We were packing up some things for the barbecue. I took a large selection of steaks and meats. Margaret took some salmon and also enough fruit so that we could make a large fruit salad, either as a side dish or in case things went wrong. Dahlia was going to bring home another guy. We've met a few guys over the past few months. Perhaps seeing how happy we were, Dahlia decided to try to find happiness for herself. She had been telling us about this guy for weeks, and she was sure this guy could be the one. A couple of hours later, with the grill already preheated, we heard Dahlia's excited voice as the car pulled up next to my Mustang GT and Margaret's convertible. Dahlia ran out onto the terrace and rushed towards me, all covered in long legs and hair. Her grandmother's surprised look was rewarded with a quick, Sorry, Grandma. Sometimes I just really miss him. Oh, Dahlia said. Stanley, Grandma, this is... Carl Thomas, I said. Um, hello, Mr. Laurel, Carl said. I really like your house, and I think I'm in love with your, uh, daughter. He took a long sip. Have you met each other yet? Dahlia asked. Yes, I said. I watched him grow up. His older brother is married to my daughter, Amber. Oh, shit, Dahlia said. Language D, said Margaret. Well, no matter how familiar we all are with each other, let's just have a good time and eat, okay? We all agreed. Later, as we sat back and enjoyed the evening, we watched the almost indescribable beauty of the sky changing colors over the desert as the moon rose. Mr. Laurel, what happened? asked Carl. I remember growing up. You were one of the coolest dads we knew. Now, years later, you're still the same guy. But my brother and Amber never talk about you. And Amber gets so angry when someone mentions you. My brother has nothing against you. He remembers you the same way I do. I sighed. I haven't thought about my family for a long time. Every time someone brings up the old days or the things we all used to do together, Amber goes on her after what he did to my mom tirade, and we just don't bring it up anymore. I don't spend much time with them because of this. My brother seems to be slowly fading away but he loves Amber so much that he has no choice, especially now that she's pregnant. I shook my head. The good mood of the evening disappeared. Carl, I said, I hope things work out for you and Dahlia. Dahlia is a much better and kinder girl than Amber. Amber seems to be starting to pick up on her mother's traits, and as bad as it sounds from me, the best thing that can be done for your brother is to get him out of there. Sorry, honey. Margaret came over and took my hand. She nodded to me. Looks like Amber is becoming her mother all over again, I said. If this is not stopped, she will become a vindictive and controlling bitch like her mother, and your brother will slowly fade away.
just like I was on the way too. They will argue over everything and nothing, and he will slowly lose every, she will use everything she can to get her way and control him until their existence together becomes one continuous series of battles in an endless war. Do you think I'm happy now? Yes, you're right. I'm happy. I'm much happier than I ever would have been if I'd stayed with Linda. Don't get me wrong. I love my daughter and I miss her. But she did my choice. I tried to maintain contact with her. She sided with her mother and pushed me out of her life and not the other way around. And it seems that Linda never told anyone the true reason for our divorce. As she should, she is trying to poison my daughter against me and blame me for what she did. Carl, I said. You want to try to save your brother from a life in hell? Hell yes, he said. Okay, next weekend I think you should invite Danny and Amber here for a barbecue. It's time for everyone to find out what really happened. Don't tell them whose house it is. Just tell them you want them to meet your family. Girls. Over the next week, Margaret and I prepared ourselves mentally for what was to be a very stressful time. We had several long conversations about what could happen and what it would mean for us. In the end, we both knew it didn't mean anything. Not for us, anyway. Regardless of how the evening ended, I was happy to have Margaret in my life. So happy that I dragged her into town midweek and married her on the spot that Wednesday. It was just the two of us and Dahlia. This didn't change anything because we were already married in every sense except the official one. Sure, she tried to kill me with sex that night, but that's what she usually did. The whole point of the barbecue was to try to save Danny from what I went through. If it also serves as a lesson in what not to do for Carl and Dahlia, that would be even better. And finally, if it could help get Amber's head out of her mother's ass and allow me to get my daughter back and maybe even be a part of my grandchild's life, when he or she is born, that would be even better. There could only be victories here because no matter how the evening ended, I would still have Margaret and Dahlia. On the morning of the barbecue, we received an urgent call from Carl. Everything went according to plan, but a problem arose. Amber insisted on taking Linda with her. If Linda doesn't come, then Amber won't come, and she'll probably make Danny not come either. I told Carl it was okay. Let him bring Linda too. All this is long overdue. We arranged that Margaret and I would not be at home when they arrived. Carl will be in the house with Dahlia. Amber and Dahlia never dated. Danny has never met Dahlia either. Linda knew Dahlia, but we hoped that she did not associate Dahlia with me. Everything went according to plan. Carl and Dahlia settled everyone in and began to win them over. They were all sitting on the terrace when Margaret drove up to the house and went to meet them. She apologized for my lateness saying that I had to stop at the liquor store for beer and other drinks. Danny asked about her Mustang and said how much he liked it. She said he would probably like her husband's car even more. Amber snorted and told him not to get his hopes up because they needed something much more practical. Linda, who had barely spoken, asked Margaret about her bracelet. At that moment I just arrived. No one noticed me when I got out of the car and walked towards the group. I had the exact same bracelet, Linda complained. No, Mom, Amber answered coldly. One of your friends told you that your dad bought you one, but he never gave it to you. I think your friend was wrong. Amber, your father actually bought me that damn bracelet, Linda snorted. He left the check behind when he left. I think he just went crazy from all the drinking and gambling. Mom, what's the difference? Amber asked. He abandoned you for no apparent reason and left you alone. He was a selfish bastard. I seriously doubt it, Margaret said calmly. How can you know this? Amber asked sharply. Were you there? No, I wasn't there, said Margaret. But your mom was right. And Amber, you need to put your hate writ aside for a second. How do you really remember your father? Was he selfish when you were growing up? Well, he was great when I was a kid, but maybe I'm just remembering wrong. If he was so terrible, why did he leave my mom for no reason? And what do you mean my mom was right? Amber asked. Because it was your mother's bracelet, said Margaret. She took off the bracelet and turned it over. Amber read the inscription. Linda, after all these years and all the tears, with love, Stan. Linda struggled with depression for a long time. She was already taking medication, 
but hearing the sign made her lose control again. My bracelet, my bracelet, she started screaming. How did you get this? Amber asked. I gave it to her, I said. I was going to erase the writing and change it. But I asked him not to do it, said Margaret. I wanted it as a memory of a very stupid woman who lost everything for nothing. My bracelet, Linda hissed. I want my bracelet. Why are you here, Dad? Amber asked. After you abandon us, you should never have shown your face anywhere. Amber, I've never abandoned anyone, especially not you, I said. I tried to keep in touch with you during and after the divorce, but you always returned to the topic of your mom and her experiences. Finally, I told you that I didn't want to hear about her, and you told me that if we couldn't talk about this, then maybe we shouldn't talk at all. I kept calling you anyway, but you always hung up. Dad, Mommy was in so much pain, Amber said, and you just disappeared. You didn't even tell her why, and you left her with no money and no place to live. It wasn't right. There was no reason for it. She loved you. Amber had tears streaming down her cheeks. I extended my arms, and she, like a little girl, rushed to me and hugged me. You're still wrong for what you did, Dad, she said after a few moments. Amber, I said. We all need to sit down and talk. Carl, get to the steaks. Dahlia, honey, cut up the fruit and get the drinks ready while the four of us talk. What about Mom? Amber asked. I think she should just lie in the hammock, I said. Amber went and brought her mother, who stood there just looking at me and repeating, My bracelet. Her eyes were huge and expressionless. She looked like a fat version of Gollum. When we all sat down at the table, I took Margaret's hand and began. Amber... Your mom and I were married for a long time. We had good years and I loved her. But over time, your mom changed. She lost sight of what was really important. When we first got married, the most important thing was being together. Later, it became you. Then other things crept in. All couples argue. It's normal and good for a couple to learn to deal with it. In fact, how you resolve your differences can even strengthen. A marriage. But your mom became more and more controlling over the years. Danny looked straight at Amber. Towards the end, my dear, our marriage became more of a battle of wills than a real love relationship. The last argument dragged on for weeks. It was after I took early retirement and we were tired of arguing in different countries. Your mother got to the point that she didn't ask me to do anything anymore. She practically ordered me to do what she wanted. And every time I refused, the answer was always the same, no sex. This became her favorite trump card. Amber looked at me strangely. That was one of the pieces of advice she gave me too, she said. She looked at Danny. It works. Danny looked at the floor. No, honey, I said. It doesn't work. Everything you do has consequences that you may not see for years. In my case, it got to the point where I was just tired of being controlled and decided I wouldn't. Our last argument was so stupid that I'm still wondering about it. She ordered me to take out the trash. I refused. She resorted to her usual strategy. She told me that if I didn't take out the trash, there wouldn't be sex for a very long time. I said, okay. Amber looked at me strangely. Yeah, that didn't work, I said. So we went weeks without sex. We didn't talk to each other for days. And even when we started talking again, the stalemate in the bedroom continued. Methy just took it too far. Sex with your mom was something like that. I loved her even with all the changes she went through, but it wasn't worth my self-respect. Amber looked at Margaret. Margaret smiled at her, but didn't say a word. I nudged her with my elbow. Amber, I never cheated on your mother. Margaret and I only met after the divorce was final. But I might meet someone. Anyway, after a while, I noticed that your mother suddenly started being nice to me again. I felt like shit arguing about something so stupid even though we supposedly loved each other. I guess I started to think that the feelings I had for her were much more important than some stupid argument. So I planned a big Valentine's Day for us as a way to get over the fight and be ourselves again. I bought a bracelet, flowers, and a bunch of other nonsense. Linda came to her senses again and moved on. Have you fallen in love with me again? She asked. I nodded. Did you love me even though I was fat and mean? I nodded again. And then what happened, Stanley? She asked. Why did you leave me? 
Linda, I followed you when you went out to take out the trash the day before Valentine's Day, I said. Linda's eyes widened and she began to cry. Come on, Amber, she called. I don't want to listen to this crap anymore. Why not, Mom? Amber asked. Because she doesn't want you to know the real reason for our divorce, I said. He's making this all up, Linda snapped. Amber, let's go, damn it. Tell me, Daddy, Amber said. When I followed your mother, she walked out to the end of the alley behind our apartment. It was dirty and disgusting there. I expected her to just throw the trash bags in the trash and go back to the apartment. She got busy sex with another fat man on the hood of his car. Both Amber and Danny were shocked. I know it sounds bad, baby, but they've obviously done this before. This was not a one-time act. But for me, that was it. This was the end of the marriage. I don't know how long she refused to have sex with her husband, the man she married and supposedly loved, but it was normal for her to wallow in the trash and study sex with this lump of mucus. He's lying, baby, Linda whined. You know I would never do that. I put the phone on the table and pressed the button. The video was already on. Amber watched as her mother walked straight up to Dino and, without saying a word, simply lifted her skirt and leaned over. Linda tried to take the phone away. Amber, if only Danny was doing sex with any other woman, would you stay married to him? I asked. Amber was too lost in thought to even respond. Carl bought two plates, each with a large steak on it, and placed them in front of Amber and Danny. Salmon for me and the running man, Margaret said to Carl, who nodded. So, Dad, why don't you... Amber began. She never finished her sentence, so I started talking. What should I have done? I asked. I was in pain and in a lot of pain. I think I could have handled everything better. I'm sure I was being unfair, but I wanted to get some of my self-respect back. To do this, you need to take it away from someone else. For me to come out of this in one piece, Dino and your mother had to lose some of their self-respect. So the mother left and was left broke, Amber said. She has mood swings and episodes where she drifts in and out of reality. And all this time I blamed you. But it wasn't really your fault. In fact, it was guilt, I said. So now that she knows why we actually broke up, maybe she can start getting back together. But Daddy, why didn't you confront her then? Amber asked. Why not just walk up to them and kick both their asses in that alley? I don't know. I said. At first I was too shocked by what was happening. I didn't know why this happened and I still don't. I thought I looked decent, but your mother, the woman I loved and married, would rather have sex with a fat, fat-assed, glorified janitor and wallow in the dirt doing it to him. What kind of loser have I been? What's the point? She would probably just tell me that it's her body and she can give it to whoever she wants. I would never do that, Linda said. Stanley, I loved you as much as you loved me. You just don't understand what my life has been like. When we first met, I was pretty. Over the years, the world around us has changed. When we got married, it was normal for a woman to stay at home and take care of the children and the house. Over the past ten years, this has become rare. Most of my friends, even married ones, have jobs or have had jobs at some point. Even those who had children sometimes returned to work when their children grew up. You, Stanley, you had a whole life outside of our home. You're a brilliant engineer with patents hanging out of your ass. Your company paid you millions to just walk away and give them your damn patents. Even Amber had a life outside of our home. She had friends and clubs and all this crap. I had nothing but our life and our home. And yes, Stanley, over the years, I have allowed myself to relax. When we first met, I didn't have to work out or anything. I was naturally slim and beautiful. I watched you run and lift weights and just laughed at you because I didn't have to do any of that shit. I could just bend over in a tight skirt and you would do whatever I wanted. I controlled everything in our house. Even after I had Amber and my body got a little fatter, I could make you do whatever I wanted. So what was the point in all that sweating and grunting? Later I convinced myself that I was old and most women my age are a little saggy. Have a few bags and a few extra pounds. But Stanley, damn, you were consistent. If one of my friends was talking about a car, or I saw an ad for a vacation to Jamaica, I knew I could get it. 
All I had to do was spread my legs, and we would be on the plane in no time. It never occurred to me that you did this, not because I controlled you, but because you loved me, and sex was just a part of that love. Until a few moments ago, when I heard you tell Amber that you could just find someone else to have sex with, I never realized how much you had to love me to put up with all my bullshit. But Stanley, it was all I had. Maybe I was perverted. I know I was wrong, but it was all I had. When we first met, I loved having sex with you. Over time, I loved it even more, but I guess in the last few years I forgot that. Sex became more of a tool to achieve what I wanted than a way to show you how much I love you. And Stanley, never doubt that I loved you. We created and raised a very beautiful daughter together, and I love her, but I have always loved you. There's an old saying that if all you have is a hammer, you start to see all problems as nails. Well, Stanley, sex was the only thing I thought I had. So when you said you could do without my sex, that just destroyed all my self-confidence. Think about it, Stanley. Over time, you stayed in shape. There aren't many men our age who are as fit as you, and I allowed myself to get old, fat, and ugly. The only person who wanted me was you. So I allowed myself to believe that it wasn't because you loved me, which I now stupidly see what you did, but I thought it was because of the sex. I thought I had something there between my legs that was unique in the whole universe. It never occurred to me that every woman of our species had one. So when you decided that you could do without mine, as I already said, I was broken. Then Dino showed up. That bastard was always picking on anything that wore a skirt. That first night when I took out the trash, he was there. I couldn't even throw the garbage bags into the container. They were so heavy, I could barely lift them. Pick up. I always stuffed everything I could into a bag, thinking that my big strong husband would drop everything and throw them out for me. Anyway, Dino saw me struggling and came over and threw them out for me. When he picked up the first bag, his hand accidentally brushed my butt. He apologized, and honestly, I was so mad at you that I didn't even realize what he did. I told him to forget about it. He kind of said, yes, that's just the price of the matter. The next evening he was there again, and when he threw away the bags, he deliberately grabbed my butt. I was shocked, but I remembered the previous evening, so I didn't say anything. The next evening he said the price was going up. I was wearing a skirt, and he ran his hand over my legs. A lot of thoughts were spinning in my head. But the fact is that I was turned on by the fact that a man younger than us wanted me. Somehow it was balanced in my head. You no longer wanted me, but he did. This meant that in some strange way, I was still in control. But that, too, was an illusion. Over the next weeks, he constantly increased his demands until we had sex. At first I felt bad about it and felt guilty. But Stanley, part of me was needy. I needed someone to want me. You didn't want me anymore. And Dino was smart. He knew he had something to hook me with. So whenever I resisted, he just didn't show up for days. I know it's the oldest cliche in the world, but it wasn't for sex. I didn't like it at all. You saw on that phone that he was too rough with me. But if I didn't act like I liked it, or if I acted like I didn't like it, he just told me that there were other women in the building who liked it or he just didn't show up for a while. By the time I caught him again, I was so desperate that I did everything he said just because someone wanted me. I learned to act like I liked it even when I didn't, and I learned to say things that fed his ego. I had to do it, Stanley, because without him I had nothing. Why do you think I'm being nice to you again? She asked. Even though I didn't win the argument, I actually gave up. Remember when I told you that we could have sex whenever you wanted? But, Stanley, you never wanted it again. I know now that it's because you saw me with him and were so disgusted by me that you were already planning to leave. Then I heard from one of my friends about the bracelet and the party you were planning for us. It really could be a new beginning for us, Stanley. I wanted it. That's why I kept trying to get back into bed with you. Stanley, that's it. All you ever needed to do was just let me know you wanted me. I never stopped loving you. Things just got out of hand. Mom, why did you make me believe that it was all Dad's fault? Amber shouted. And all your advice. It's all your attempts to control, isn't it? There should be no control in a relationship, I said. Honey, 
The best way to control is to love someone so much that they have no choice but to stay with you. Just like me and Margaret. What about Dino? Linda asked. Stanley, you were the reason he was fired, weren't you? I simply nodded my head and smiled. I didn't say anything, but I did more than just fire Dino. Dino was limping due to the beating he received and that he had essentially become a eunuch before his death a few months ago. I had nothing to do with this. Dino was always out of shape. He had trouble breathing when he had sex with Linda. He died of a massive heart attack. Listen, I said, the past is gone. We can't go back and change all these things. I'm not sure I would even want to, if I could. I did lose a lot of time with my daughter, but in the process I developed a bond with my other daughter, granddaughter, Dahlia. I would love to be a part of Amber and Danny's life again. But Amber, you need to take a serious look at your life. I really don't want to watch your marriage become like your mom's and mine. Preventing this was actually the reason for our meeting, and I think it's time for us all to move on. It happened, but it's over. And looking at the situation with fresh eyes, I can admit that perhaps part of it was my fault. I may have contributed to, your mom became the person she became. Perhaps I should have encouraged her to go out and develop her own interests so she would be less dependent on me. That way, control would be less of an issue. I can also admit that I was far from perfect on my own. I was probably as stubborn as your mom and just got to the point where I first dug my heels into the sand and refused to give in. Maybe if we, they both learned to compromise, it would never have happened. And one more thing, maybe, maybe I'm just lazy. Maybe this whole thing started because I didn't want to get off the couch and take out the trash. So for what I contributed to this, Linda, I'm sorry. And I also want to apologize for just leaving you like that. That wasn't a mature way of dealing with the problem. It doesn't justify what you did, though. And honestly, that being said, I'm still not ready to forgive you for the obvious disrespect you showed me. Stanley, I wish you could understand, Linda said. Nothing I did was against you. It was just me fighting for some kind of identity outside of the U.S. Stanley, I am mentally unstable. I am currently on several different antidepressants and mood stabilizers. Even my psychiatrist is not sure if my mental instability was caused by the end of our marriage or if it was what led to the behavior that ended our marriage. She just doesn't know. But I can tell you what I know. Not a day goes by that I, I didn't regret it. I haven't had a single day when I didn't regret that we weren't still together. There was a long, tense pause as everyone waited to hear what I would say. However, Margaret saved the situation because everything was going well and she wanted to keep it that way. Well, I'm not sorry you two aren't together anymore, she said and everyone laughed. So what, Dad? Amber asked. What about the fact that you are an alcoholic and have a gambling addiction? No comment, I said. I still wasn't going to give Linda a dime. Whatever her reasons for cheating, I saw no reason to pay her for it. I'm sure some people might look at me and think I'm still being stubborn and maybe being a jerk about it, but I don't see it that way. For over 30 years, I went to work and provided Linda with the lifestyle she loved and expected. Linda never had to go to work a day in her life. All she ever had to do was say, I want, and whatever she wanted, she got. I just don't see any reason to pay her to ruin our marriage and impact so many people's lives. Maybe I'm still stubborn, but that's my way of looking at things. That's why I didn't answer my daughter's question, because I didn't want to lie to her. She and Linda could easily try to drag me to court and renegotiate the terms of the divorce. Then I would just have to find another way to keep my money out of her hands. He still doesn't like taking out the trash. Margaret said, but I now know not to try to force him to do it. Even Linda laughed at this. Okay, guys, let's eat, I said. Over the next few hours, we ate, drank, and had a good time. We agreed to get together more often and try to become a real strong family. I was excited to be a part of Amber's life again and truly hoped that she could change. But at least now everything was clear, and I had closure with the past. As for the future, I love Margaret, and will always love her, and Dahlia will always be my daughter. She and I are actually closer than me and Amber, 
even though we're not related by blood. She and Carl got married, and yes, they named their first son Stanley after me and his little sister Stanna. Linda and I never became friends again. There was too much pain and suffering, mostly caused by her jealousy and controlling behavior. She and Margaret eventually became friends in their own ways. Margaret started it that very first night. Well, maybe Linda started it. As they prepared to leave, Linda actually approached Margaret and thanked her for inviting her to her home. Margaret looked at me, and I just shrugged. She removed the bracelet from her wrist and placed it on Linda. Hold it, she said. It was meant for you anyway. Besides, the bracelet was only supposed to represent the love of the man who bought it, and I have this. And you always will, I said. As we watched them ride off into the sunset, I hugged Margaret, and she sighed. I'm glad it's finally over, I said. The past is behind us. Now we can build our future together. Stanley, my wrist feels empty, Margaret said, smiling. Why are you telling me this? I asked. You gave away your bracelet. Because it was her bracelet anyway, she said. You should buy me your own. Margaret, that was almost two years ago, I said. Do you realize how much that bracelet is worth now? The price of gold has almost doubled, and the price of diamonds has also increased. She just smiled at me. Okay, I said. The jewelry store in the mall is probably still open. I don't think they close until ten. Tomorrow, dear, she said. There's something else besides my wrist that needs your attention tonight. What? I asked. I miss you so much. It's been a few hours now. Can we do this in our bed? Or do you need me to roll around in the trash with you? Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.